Welcome everyone to our regular weekday morning podcast on Kabbalah for Heretics with me, your heretic in chief, Yaakov Leib HaKohen. I think you know if you've been listening that for the past 30 years, literally, every weekday morning without exception, except for very rare exceptions, we have been going systematically through the Zohar, volume by volume, cover to cover, page by page, sentence by sentence. And over this past 30 years of doing that, we have completed volumes 1, 2, and 3. We just recently completed volume 4, and we are just at the beginning now of volume 5, the final volume of the Zohar. It will probably take us three or four years to to complete volume five, that's about the time it takes for each volume. And uh, we go slowly, we go thoroughly, we go deeply. So just to let you know, and now let's get back to where we left off in our last podcast. Just to bring you up to date, uh, we are in the first paragraphs of of the Zohar, and it is immediately discussing sacred sexuality. It is taking written passages from the Torah, which is what the Zohar does, and unpacking and revealing their hidden esoteric meaning. For example, we left off with it saying, Rabbi Chia then expounded on the next verse. The heart of her husband trusteth in her, and she shall have no lack of spoil. Notice that. Now, on a superficial, regular reading, it, it is what it appears to be. It's about how trustworthy a good wife is, and so forth. But that is not within the context of everything else being discussed. What is really being discussed? The heart of her husband trusteth in her. Try to visualize that as a very esoteric, metaphorical description of the husband sexually entering the wife. And she shall have no lack of spoil, and she shall be aroused in turn by it. He goes on. The husband, Rabbi Chia said, is the Holy One, blessed be he, who hath appointed her to govern the whole world and placed in her hands all his armory and warriors. The intercourse here, the sacred sexuality here, is that of the Holy One, blessed be He, and His feminine counterpart, enacted on the conjugal bed by two people. The husband, he said, is the Holy One, blessed be He, who hath appointed her to govern the whole world, the feminine, who has appointed her to govern the whole world. The feminine aspect of God governs the whole world. Now, that's not something that we would normally think of in, in Jewish thought, certainly in Gnostic thought. But we can see the underlying Gnostic ideas being presented here, and we can see them as the source of the later Christian Gnosticism that evolved. The Gnostics are very clear in, in their writings. They're very clear about what they owe to the Jewish uh, adepts who joined them and brought their mysticism into Gnosticism and merged it with it. And here's a case of it, the, the primacy of the feminine. Again, you ain't going to find that in Rabbi Ginsburg's uh, Shabbos talk. 
in fact, you'll find a great deal of anger and rejection at the very idea. But that is not what's being said here. There is no rejection of the feminine here. There is a total acceptance of it and a pronouncement on the primacy of it. Let me read this again. Rabbi Chia then expounded the next verse. The heart of her husband trusteth in her, and she shall have no lack of spoil. The husband, he said, is the Holy One, blessed be he, who hath appointed her to govern the whole world, and placed in her hands all his armory and warriors. Good God! The Hebrew goddess, that's what we see here. This is a description in the Zohar of what Jewish interpretation would be very, very slow to accept, that there is a Jewish goddess right here. And this Jewish goddess, appointed by the Holy One, blessed be he, is appointed by him to govern the whole world. And he has placed in her hands all his armory and warriors. Amazing. Now, I don't want you to think, oh, I know that. You do not know this. You know that Gnosticism talks about this. But you do not know that ancient Jewish esotericism spoke of it first. You didn't know that. Try to listen and hear with open ears, not blocked by, oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. I've always known that. That's not what's being spoken of here. Yes, of course. I'm sure most of you know that in Gnosticism, there is the goddess, the feminine. But what you have not known until this point is that Jewish metaphysical thought and experience first spoke of that primacy of the feminine, but in highly esoteric terms, so that it is totally missed by the rabbis, most of them, the great majority of them, and by most Jews, practicing Jews. If you were to say to them, did you realize that there is a goddess in Judaism as well as a god? They would say, you're crazy and get away. But here it is, and we see it elsewhere in the Zohar, for example. The Zohar says, wherever the feminine is absent, God is not there. Do you hear that? Wherever the feminine is absent, God is not there. Again, revealing the primacy and the equality of the feminine to the masculine. I once asked a rabbi what that meant, and you have never seen such a confused rabbi in your life. Ultimately, what he did was he came down to the, well, that's just, that's just hearsay. <laughs> but here we see it. Rabbi Yossi took the next verse. She doeth him good and not evil all the days of her life. She being the goddess and him being the Holy One, blessed be he. She provides good for the world, for the temple of the king and those who frequent it. The blessings of the temple of Solomon derived from the feminine goddess, if I may call her a goddess, from the Shekhinah, from the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. This is very much pre-Christian and certainly pre-Gnostic. When is this? It asks rhetorically. When those days of the heaven, quote-unquote, shine upon her and unite her with her and unite with her fitly 
these being then the days of her life, because the ten Sephirois has sent to her life and shines upon her. The ten Sephirois are not just a drawing. They are a living organism within the mind of God. And it is they who empower the feminine with the Holy Spirit, with the Shekhinah. And she, in turn, empowers the world. Said Rabbi Abba, all this is well said, and all these verses can be applied to the community of Israel, Jew and Gentile in the community of Israel alike, not just the sons of Israel, not just the B'nai Israel, who function in the community of Israel, but also those who have been adopted willingly and, and enthusiastically by the Gentiles who have joined them. Not joined their religion. This has nothing to do here with the religion of Judaism. This has to do with the metaphysical concept of the community of Israel, the house of Israel. I might point out that elsewhere, the Zohar says that the function of, of uh, the uh, house of Israel cannot be achieved, that is the unification of God, without the Gentiles also being part of it. So the Jews alone in the house of Israel cannot accomplish the work of God, which is to reunite him in himself. It requires Gentiles coming into the community of Israel on equal footing with the Jew not subservient. And that combination of Esau and Jacob, Gentile and Jew, makes it fully possible to unite the disparate aspects of God into one. And as the prophet says, on that day, God shall be one and his name shall be one. We come now to another written portion of Torah that the Zohar is going to give its esoteric interpret a meaning of. It's not an, this is these are not interpretations. The Zohar does not provide interpretations of written scripture. It provides what the unwritten, uns, unwritten meaning truly is. For 4,000 years, tradition holds that when Moses received the Torah on Mount Sinai, he received it in two parts. The written Torah, which we see as the Old Testament, but the, but the secret oral Torah, which he commanded Moses not to write down, but to pass on orally from generation to generation. And that is what the Zohar is. It's a recording of the oral Torah provided to Moses at the very same time that the written Torah was given to Moses. And this oral Torah amplifies, corrects, expands upon the superficial meaning of the written Torah. It provides meaning that you do not derive from the written Torah alone. It's as if God said to Moses, here now, here, here's, here's part of the Torah, write this down. And, and God says to Moses, the heart of her husband trusteth in her, and she shall have no lack of spoil. Write that down. Now, let me tell you what that really means, and do not write this down. Therefore, the secrecy of the oral Torah for generations, it finally came to light in about the third century AD. And the, the Gentile kings and princes of the church were furious and commanded that 
all of the volumes of the oral Torah, particularly the Talmud, should be collected by their soldiers and burned, which historically happened. But of course, we Jews are fairly smart, and what they did was some people buried, hid their copies of the oral Torah, their copies of the oral Torah, the Talmud in particular, and they survived. Those those volumes survived. That will uh, complete uh, this morning's podcast. We'll continue with our next podcast. And the next begins with the written scripture. If a woman conceive seed. And we will dig into what the Zohar says of that and what it means Kabbalistically, esoterically, all of that in tomorrow's podcast. Thank you for for being here, listening. In the meantime, let me let me invite the uh, the attendees here. They are my my assistants. They are not students. This is not a class. This is a recording session of a podcast that you can can and hopefully right now are listening to on our channel on uh, YouTube. So, but but there are two or three pe people who do attend because they record, edit, and post on that channel uh, what the podcast is. I ask them at this point if they have any comments or questions. Let me ask Belteshazzar, David. Comments, questions, raise your hand if you have any. David, go ahead. Now, the reason I ask this is so that they may ask comments and questions which possibly reflect the comments and questions many of you in the listening audience have. And since you're not here and not supposed to be physically here, you can't ask them. But hopefully, my assistants will ask them in your stead. David says, the feminine rules the whole world. God damn it, that's exactly what it says. Right on, David. Isn't that amazing? Now, I know it's not amazing to you who are listening when it comes to Gnosticism, Christian Gnosticism. But it is amazing to find it in the pre-existent Judaism, the pre-Gnostic, pre-Christian Judaism. And here, David highlights it. The feminine rules the whole world. The Jewish goddess is appointed by the Holy One, blessed be he, to govern the whole world. This is a basic Gnostic comment. And the comment clearly is borrowed by the early Gnostics from the Jewish mystics who joined their ranks. Therefore, wherever the feminine is absent, God is not there. Another statement of the Zohar that uh, underlines and validates the primacy of the feminine. David goes on, the mother, Sephira Binah, gives birth to the rest of the Sephira. She does. If you look at a, if you look at a drawing of it, Keter, Chachma, and Binah. Keter is the top, then Chachma is on the right, and Binah is on the left. And it is from Binah, which means the mother, that all the remaining seven Sephiras are created. Just it, it's graphically demonstrated in the Sephiroth. Wonderful, wonderful. David and David goes on. She is given the command of all the Holy Ones, armories, and warriors. The feminine. Again, I know you know that said in Gnostic Christianity, but you did not know that it is said in the pre-Gnostic Christian, I mean Jewish theology. 
You didn't know that. There's so much, David says, in that passage of text. A lot to unpack here. Thank you, David. God bless you. I hope that uh, touches on many of the ideas and thoughts that came to those of you in the listening audience. And I thank David for them. Now let's end uh, as we do every podcast by reciting the uh, Kaddish, the sacred Kaddish, which is the holy prayer for the dead. We do it in honor of and to raise up the soul of our departed, beloved friend, comrade, and Kohen, Leonard Cohen. For you, Eliezer, Yiskadal v'yiskadash me'rabo, v'omo divro chirusei v'yam l'chmal chusei, v'chayachon v'yom echon v'chayei d'chol b'yis Yisrael, b'agalo v'yizman kore v'yimu amen. Yehei shmei rabo m'varach le'elam o'mel maya, yisbarach v'yishtabach v'yisbarach 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 shmei d'kutra b'richu, le'elam minchal b'rechaso t'shrechaso v'nechem osa, Tamiran ba movim ruamein. Yehe shlomo rabba min shamaya, vachainu alenu viako yisrael vim ruamein. Ose shalom vim ramov, hu ya ase shalom, alenu viako yisrael vim ruamein. And let everyone please say amen. Well, as I say, that completes our podcast for this morning. God willing, God gives me the strength and the life tomorrow morning. We will continue in the Zohar. In the meantime, Yivarechecha Adenoi V'yishmer